have your Bibles, I want you to take them out now. Look with me to the book of 1 Timothy. Book of 1 Timothy. And those of you that have been around here a while, you remember that uh, we kind of took a vacation away from 1 Timothy back at the end of the winter and the beginning of spring and began to talk about family and the home and, and one thing led to another and we're now getting back into the the finishing of this wonderful book that Paul is writing to Timothy and, of course, uh, to us as well. First Timothy, and uh, if you will, look with me at the third chapter. Third chapter. I heard about a brand new convert. I mean, he was just fresh. And uh, he was looking for a place to worship. So he was trying out these different churches, going from one place to another, and he uh, wound up over in one of these high church places, very liturgical, high church music, all of the ceremonialism that goes with that. Matter of fact, if you had to burp, it had to be in the bulletin to grant you permission to do that. And it's just that kind of a church, you know. And so about 10, 15 minutes into the message when the preacher was preaching, this new convert said, well, Hallelujah. The preacher got so discombobulated, his notes went everywhere all over the place. And he finally gathers himself up, begins to preach. A couple of minutes later, that brand new convert said, well, glory. Preacher's glasses fell off. He's stumbling around trying to pick him up and finally gathers himself up. A minute or two later, the old boy said, amen. By then, the preacher, just he just had enough to see motion for an usher to go over to where this young convert was praising God. And uh, the usher said, sir, you're, you're going to have to leave. You are disrupting our services. And, and the guy was so caught off guard, so surprised, he looks back up into the usher's face and he said, but sir, I've got religion. The usher said, well, you didn't get it here, so you're going to have to leave. <laughs> now, Timothy's pastoring one of those exciting kind of churches. And Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, now, uh, you, you're, you're 19, 20 years old, and, and you really got to have some guidance. You got to have some help in being able to orchestrate this church, being able to manage this church, being able to conduct the affairs of this church. And and I want to help you accomplish that, uh, this church of Ephesus. And Paul here in this passage where we are picking up where we left off, uh, it's so ironic that this week we mailed out letters uh, to men across our fellowship who um, on the outward appearances have uh, met the qualifications uh, that we are looking for in deacons. And so we have mailed those letters out inquiring of their willingness along with a questionnaire that they are to fill out and respond to. So it's really a God thing for us to be here in this passage today when Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, here are the qualifications of uh, a deacon. You remember in Acts chapter number 6 when uh, the widows were feeling neglected and so they were instructed to choose seven men and gave some qualifications uh, that these men then were to serve in the role of a deacon ministering to the physical needs of that church. Now let's pick it up in verse number 8. And uh, Paul is writing here with a flow about it. He, he's going to give us three things here in this passage. We're going to, matter of fact, we're going to finish the chapter today. Uh, we could probably stay here for a number of months, just in uh, verses 8 through uh, 16. We could stay here a number of months and just preach. And I'm going to try to cover it all here in about 25 minutes. But he gives us three things. He gives us the servants of the church, and then he gives us the church, and then he gives us the savior of the church. So let's look at the flow that he has for us here, beginning with the servants of the church. Verse number eight, likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. 
holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the, husband, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they have used the office of a deacon well, uh, of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, let me just stop there and talk to you a minute about the servants of the church. He is talking here about the essence of, uh, that's when everything is taken away, that which is left. That is the essence of uh, servanthood and these qualifications of deacons. Or, matter of fact, let me just say this, and I want you to get this straight because I, I don't want you to go to sleep on me and just tune me out and think, well, he's not talking to me. I, I am a woman or I am a, a, a student or I, I don't fit this, so I'm just going to... No, no. These are the same qualifications that any servant of Christ ought to possess in their life. Not just deacons, but all of us that seek to, to serve the Lord. Now, here, here's something that I've observed. I've been pastoring now for 42 years. And, and I've, I've, I'm telling you, I've seen this time and time again. When, when somebody comes up to me, and maybe they have just joined the church or recently uh, convert or whatever it may be and they come in and they say well uh, pastor what does it take to be a deacon in this church or pastor how soon can I be a deacon how long do I have to be here before I can be a deacon red flags start flying everywhere around me uh, because the fact of the matter is ladies and gentlemen authority doesn't show up before servanthood servanthood leads to authority and, and you don't get the authority without, first of all, uh, being that servant comes uh, not by seeking a position. Matter of fact, uh, I was uh, doing the, uh, the, the dedication of the new Roses store in the Monroe Mall this week. And the regional manager was there and he was kind of charging and challenging the employees of that store. And he kept using the word servant, servant, servant. And boy, that just triggered. I said, okay, he just opened up the door for me to talk about Jesus. And so it came time for me to pray. And I just took the opportunity at that moment to just say, you know, you, you used a great term over there. And, and, and you're never more like Jesus than you are when you are a servant. Because the Bible says he didn't come here to be served, but that he came to serve. So, so here we go. Jesus is our model about this. So Paul has given Timothy, he gives him three things here. He, first of all, he gives him some personal qualifications. And then he gives him some spiritual qualifications. And then he goes on to give him some domestic uh, qualifications. Now notice in verse number 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Not grave. That they are to be men worthy of respect. Every servant in the house of God, every servant in the kingdom of God really ought to strive for that, to be worthy of respect. You, you understand, if you want to be a servant, if you want to be filling in these positions like this, we're talking about a life of transparency. We're talking about a life of genuineness. We're talking about a life right here that has no moral inconsistencies about them. These immoral skeletons that exist in the closet, if you will, worthy of respect. Now notice the word in here that he's using in verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double tongue. Not, he says you're to be sincere. Sincere. That means you don't live a double lifestyle. L ladies and gentlemen, listen. You can't live like Hades on Saturday night and come in and praise God on Sunday morning and expect that God is going to bless your life and to answer your prayers. 
So he's talking here very plainly. Then he uses the term uh, in here, not given to much wine. I, I don't have a whole lot of stuff in my notes about that, but you, you all know my background, and you know where I came from, and you know how much that I hate beverage alcohol. If you don't know that, then you need to go pick up my little pamphlet that I wrote uh, outside uh, on should Christians drink beverage alcohol. You understand, if you believe that Jesus turned water into a toxic beverage that gets people drunk, you don't know your Bible. You don't know your Bible. He didn't turn the water into a beverage that causes men to go banana. You know, I've never seen anything good ever come from beverage alcohol. Nothing ever good came from it. So he said, don't, don't give in to that stuff. Then he, then he goes on verse 8, not, not greedy of filthy uh, lucre. That, that means to disenfranchise yourself from the desire of wanting to get rich quick. The pyramid schemes. The lottery. Hello? Don't, don't seek that. That one version, the New English version says, don't be a money grubber. I, I really like that, that, that term of get rich quick. Di disentangle yourself from those things. You know, the Bible over and over and over again warns us about the desire of being rich. Just don't seek it. Now, those are the personal qualifications. Now, he moves on to the spiritual qualifications. Look at verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, when he's talking about the mystery of the faith, he's not talking about something that has been concealed. You, you don't have to go scratching around and searching for and digging up faith. It's not hidden someplace. Uh, but it has been revealed here. It's something that is manifested to us. It, you, if, you, if you read Paul's letter to the church at Eph, uh, Ephesians, then you discover that uh, Paul, what Paul's talking about here is that Jesus, say the word Jesus. Jesus is the mystery of the faith. Jesus is the one that has been uh, revealed. Now notice what else he says, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure uh, conscience. The, the mystery of the faith. P powerful words. You, you understand, the only way, th thank God I, I, I sent you out in that email last Friday, not the not day before yesterday, but the week before, encouraging you to join me. And, and, and let's, let's recapture our, our daily Bible reading. And I encourage you to read Proverbs with me and Psalms with me. At that time, I was reading the book of Joshua. I finished that. And God just, man, unloaded and downloaded a bunch of stuff out of Joshua into my life. I've moved over now to the book of Judges. And boy, is he ever showing me some great truths in the Word of God. Let, let, let me say a word to you about that if I can. The only way that you're ever going to hold on to the deep truths of the Word of God is to spend time daily. In the Word of God. Studying. Meditating. Then verse 10, uh, he says, And let these also first be proved, and let them hold the office, or let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. And then he moves on now to the domestic qualifications. Verse 11. Even so, must their wives be grave, sincere, not slanders, don't, they don't give in to gossip, sober, faithful uh, in all things. Now, the word wives in there is, is a good word. Uh, oftentimes it's translated women. Uh, here it is uh, appropriately translated as wives. If you read the context uh, before and you read after and put it in its proper context. So it, it, in, the, in your King James Bible, it is translated like it ought to be translated as the word uh, wives at this point. So he, he's narrowing it down. Uh, the, the, the deacons are told some things and are, are, are made aware of things uh, in our meetings that they are to hold in confidence. Now I have never advocated that in our meetings, men, don't you go home and tell your wife about these things. 
If, if, if that was a concern, he didn't, didn't be a deacon to begin with. If he had a wife that was known as a gossip and a slanderer and couldn't hold on to confidence, he should have never been elected to start with. So, so it, it meant they got to be married to women who have uh, those kinds of traits of being very confidential, to hold things in strict confidence. I, I've been married for 48 years. My wife has been married to a preacher for 42 years. And, and I promise you, in the 42 years that I've been pastoring a church, my wife has not one time ever betrayed the confidence of anything or anyone in our fellowships, ever. Uh, she is that kind of person. That, uh, must have a wife, if you're a deacon, that, that keeps the gossip down and, and her tongue must be in control. The Bible says she, that he is to be the husband of one wife. He is to manage his household well. Go to verse 13. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. That, that's phenomenal to me. When I read verse 13, I want to say, wow. Because that's just the opposite of what we do oftentimes in the political world. It's the difference in what we do in, in our professional lives oftentimes. And it's certainly different in what most churches that I know that the way they go about things. You, you, you find a vacancy, you find an open uh, spot in there that has to be filled and what I have seen more churches do more often than not is that they will find an old boy out of the church and make him a deacon in hopes that once he's made a deacon he then will start following what the Bible says a deacon ought to look like that's not scriptural I thank God for the men in this church. I really do. I thank God for our deacons. And one of the, one of the things I'm so thankful for is I watch these old boys as they rotate off. You know, they have three years on and, and then they have to be off a year before they can be reelected again. And I've watched their life. And those men who rotate off, you can't tell by their lifestyle that they're not a deacon. Why? Because they were deaconing before they were elected. They deaconed while they were in the office and they're still deaconing when they rotated off. They still serve God faithfully. It's an amazing phenomenon. You, you got to develop a servant's heart. You can't just put people in office hoping that after they get in office, they'll do something. Amen goes right there. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about the church for a minute, okay? Let, let's talk about the church. Notice beginning in verse 14. These things write I unto you, hoping to come to you shortly. But if I tarry along, that uh, you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Now, now watch this last phrase because it gets good right here. Which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, and he's talking here, first of all, the church as being... God's household. This is not the church. This is not the church. This is a building. So, so when, when you're at home and you're saying, well, I'm going to run down to the church. No, you're not. We're the church. We are of the household of faith. Paul, the, Paul calls that the household. That implies that we are family. In 1949, I was physically born into a family with a father and a mother and with a brother and with a sister. In 1970, I was born again. I have a new father and I have brothers and sisters in the Lord that are part of my family. And part of the responsibility that is given to me 
is to have love and compassion on my family. One of the greatest examples that I could give you of that is about two miles down the road uh, is a woman who had a split-level house that was just falling apart all around her. She had been the, what do you call, um, not a, she wasn't adopting kids, but she, what is it, fostered kids. I, could, I lost the name. She was a foster parent to almost 60 kids. And, and, and the plumbing, the roof, the floor was just decimated. And I watched in a weekend that this fellowship went down to her house, put on a new roof, installed new plumbing, installed new flooring, gave her a brand new house on the inside that would make anybody proud. Why? Because we are of the household of faith taking care of the people that are in our family. That kind of love and that kind of compassion. As a family, we are to love one another. Now, he calls the church the church of the living God. The church of the living God. A friend of mine was in Biloxi, Mississippi uh, several years ago. And he tells me about this uh, church sign uh, that was the name of the church. And uh, the name of the church was uh, Church of the Living God, Fire Baptized, Spirit-Filled, Anointed Church. I, I think we ought to change our name. I, I really do. I bet you the, the, the services inside that church were exciting services. That, that, that's a good biblical name. But I want to stress here for a minute the church of the living God. Paul says to Timothy here, when you come together as the body of Christ, uh, worshiping him, you get into the presence of the living God. And when you get into the presence of the living God, ladies and gentlemen, something going to happen when you get together. Something's going to change. You're going to be blessed, causing some things to happen that don't normally happen. I, I want to tell you, that's not always true where I go. I, I, I'm telling you, I go into more churches like this than you could ever imagine, and, 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 and I want to be like Ezekiel when Ezekiel looked out over that valley of dry bones and said, can these bones live? And, and I come to the conclusion, no, let's just say amen and go home. <laughs> it, it, it's just not like that. You, you see, when God's people come together, there ought to be, they, they ought to be lively people. Church ought to be an exciting, it ought to be the most exciting time of our week. Now, now notice what else he says in here. That, that's one of the most powerful things. He says, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, I've been to Ephesus. And I hope I can remember to get this right. Um, but the church at Ephesus, or in Ephesus there in the temple, they had 127 pillars around that temple. And on top of the pillar... Uh, was a four-foot marble statue of some god that they worshipped. So when, when, you, when you're thinking about what Paul is referring to in this, uh, this passage, he says the church is like a pillar. It only exists to hold up the Lord Jesus Christ and to display him and to expose him and to pull the veil from him. Now understand, the church is a pillar. The church is not God. The church is a pillar. It's not salvation. The church is, is the foundation of the truth. Now, now what is the truth? Thank God for the 66 books that I hold in my hand. Thank God that every word of it is true. But the, the church 
is not holding up these six. We ought to preach this. And, and we ought to expose. But what, what Paul's referring to here is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are to be pillars. The church is to be a pillar that holds up Jesus, that preaches Jesus. The, the purpose of the church is to say, we must decrease, and so he must increase. I, I don't care if the world ever sees the pillar. But to see Christ, who sits on the pillar. I don't care if the world ever is made aware of First Baptist Church and Indian Trail. I, I don't care if the world ever uh, comes to know Mike Whitson as pastor of First Baptist Church in Detroit. I want them to see Jesus on the pillar. I, I have this asked to me all the time, everywhere I go. Mike, Mike what do you attribute the growth uh, of First Baptist Indian Trail? When you went there, 170 people. What do you attribute the growth to? Now, the first thing that hits my mind is uh, an old mountain boy who was born into a, uh, an alcoholic home who'd been on his own since he's about 14 years old. Had my first full-time job, had my driver's license when I was 14. Put myself through school. Uh, I, I, and I want to, but, so, so the only explanation that I want to give is the sovereignty of God. When they ask, what, what do you attribute? The sovereignty uh, of God. I, I want to answer, that's the logical a, explanation. But, but then I'm reminded of something that happened uh, way back, um, my mom and dad's pastor for 20, 25 years, 90 years old, blind. You, you may know the story, but blind. And he, he moved out of the mountains over to his son's house or daughter's house in Concord. And I went over to visit him one day. And I sat at his feet for just hours. Just sat there and listened to him. And while I was there, God gave me the theme, the passage on which this ministry is built. John 12, 32. When somebody asks me to sign their Bible, I always sign my name and I'll put John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up, if I am on the pillar, if I am unveiled, if I am exposed and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. The only explanation for the growth of the ministry of this church is that we are a pillar that lifts up the name. By the way, that's a good word. I, I got in my son-in-law's car just the other day and, and I, I saw where he had the lift on the back glass of his truck and I smiled and I said to him, you know, I love that name. Why? It, it's the pillar. Y'all don't get excited like I do. I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm about to have a spell up here and y'all can't. Um, that's been our aim. To, to be the pillar. The foundation of the truth. So, so let, me, let, let me hurry and give you the last one. It's the Lord of the church. The, the Lord of the church. Look at verse 16. And by the way, this passage, I promise you, we could spend months. We could spend months. I, I'm trying to cover an awful lot in 30 minutes here. We could spend months at it. But, but this is one of the most, well, not most. It is the unique passage in all of the Bible that describes Jesus. Now notice with me, if you will, the incarnation. In verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Let me, our salvation didn't come from a God who was sitting up in glory, looking down on mankind, and by some manner of osmosis, you and I are able... No. The Bible says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. He walked 
the dusty roads of Palestine. He was tempted in every fashion that you and I, and boy, I reminded of this so often when, when temptation hits me. It's nothing that Jesus himself didn't face. He was tempted in every point, yet without sin. God was made flesh and dwelt amongst the incarnation. Second thing I want you to see is the vindication. Watch this now. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. The vindication of the spirit. Do you remember when Jesus came uh, down to the Jordan River to hook up with John the baptizer? And he said, I, I want to get baptized. And John got him down into the water. And, and as he was being baptized, the Bible says that the spirit of God descended like a dove and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He was justified by the spirit, vindicated uh, by the Spirit like no one else. And then the observation, uh, watch this, he was seen of angels. When was he seen of angels? In, in that hour of temptation, the Bible says that the angels came out of glory and they ministered to him. Now, let's keep on. I, I want you to see next is the proclamation. Preached unto the Gentiles. Preached among the, the, the nations, if you will. You understand, it's Jesus whom Paul is holding up for Timothy to preach. I'm going to get over here just a minute because this is just kind of a personal pet thing with me that really bothers me today. When I go listen to some podcasts or I go on the internet to some websites and I pull up some of the sermons... Uh, that people are preaching across this land out here. And, and, and I'm hearing this subject and I'm hearing that. Su I'm not smart enough, I promise you, to address a bunch of the garbage, excuse me, some of the subject matters that are being addressed in pulpits all across this country. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world are you doing? That's not what we're challenged and called to do. We're called, just like Paul said to Timothy, preach Jesus. Preach him. Now, by the way, I'm, I'm of this opinion. I'm going to wind up the sermon here with this statement in a minute. I, I, I tell you, if we lift up Jesus and if we preach Jesus, he can take care of all of that other stuff that everybody is trying to preach about. All right, let me, let me go on. Now watch what the, the, the salvation here. Preach unto the Gentiles. Believed on in the world. Salvation. Isn't it amazing to see new Christians? One of the great things that I enjoy about First Baptist is, is watching believers come to faith or watching people become new believers, watching them come to faith in Christ. I, I'll never forget, boy, right after I was saved, and a couple of years later I was leading the music at, at my little home church in, in Marietta, South Carolina, and my best friend sat back there on the back row and and, and, and the next day he called me and said, I need to talk to you. I went by his house and led him to Jesus and his wife. And to see what God did with my best friend. We played on a state championship basketball team to get a ran track, to get a played baseball, to get a To watch what God did with him was absolutely phenomenal. How God changed his life. I love what Steve Gaines said. I, I don't know if you were here on that very first Monday night or not. You, you ought to have been here just for this one statement. Just for this one statement. If God is nudging you, if God is wooing you and drawing you to go talk to somebody that you know about Christ and to share your story, don't you believe that the same God who is burdening you for them is also burdening their heart to trust Jesus? I thought, wow, how true. Believed in the world. And then, now watch the glorification here in the last part of verse 16. Received up into glory. Ascended into glory with a glorified 
body. You're not going to find this description of Jesus anywhere else in all of the Bible. It's that unique. Now, I've said all of that. No, I've got to quit. I've got to quit. I've said all of it to say this. Look at me a minute. Everybody in the building, look this way a minute. Jesus is all you need. He's all you need. If your marriage is falling apart, he can fix your marriage. If you've lost your job, struggling financially, Jesus is all you need. This lady stopped me in the hallway before the 8 o'clock service and she told me everything that was going on in her physically the night before and what she was facing even now. I just want you to understand, if you're in a physical storm, Jesus is all you need. He's all you need. No matter what you're facing, he's more than adequate. He can meet every need of your life. Now, here's the big deal. If you want to have peace and joy and contentment and freedom from sin and guilt and shame and you want deliverance from your past and you want hope for the future, Jesus is all you need. He's all you need. So I want you to stand with me and let's just pray for a minute. Matthew's going to come and he's going to lead us in our hymn of invitation. Father God, thank you so much for your word today. And, and Father, it's, it's really blessed me. If, if nobody else has been blessed, God, I thank you for what you've poured into me here today. And, and God, I just pray for those that are here this morning that, that just really need a touch from you. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you'd speak loudly to them right now. Let them know that, Lord, you're more than enough to meet every need of their life. God, for that man or that woman that's here, and God, it's just one of those days when I know that there's a man right here that you're dealing with. God, I could go put my hand on his shoulder right now. It's so obvious and evident that you are working on him. Lord, today, I, I don't even know who he is. I couldn't call his name, but God, you know who he is. And, and Lord, I, I just pray that you would continue to strive with him and that you would woo him to yourself here this morning, God. And God, for those that are struggling in their marriage, God, I pray that if, if that marriage could focus in on you, Lord, if they could just stay with their eyes on you, if they could just trust you and depend on you, and, and, and God, just let you do a work in their life. God, I, I know that their marriage could be healed. God, touch that home today. Restore that home today. No matter what the needs are, you're more than enough. And I pray, God, that folks would come today and just seek you on behalf of whatever that need might be. For it's salvation, just a recommitment for healing. Move in their heart today. 